Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Amy Wren. I'm the Member Services Librarian at the Capital District Library Council. I'd like to welcome you to our third virtual member tour and the fourth tour in our series. Today we'll be touring Albany County Historical Association. Their Executive Director, Catherine Costo, will be guiding us on the tour. During and after the tour, please submit any questions you may have through the Q&A function. Um, we'll hold all questions uh, till the end after Catherine finishes the tour. So I'll now hand it over to you, Catherine. Good morning, um, Amy. I want to thank you so much and the Capital District Library Council for this wonderful opportunity. Um, I'm delighted to be with you this morning uh, virtually, and um, I'm so happy to share with you what we have here at the Albany County Historical Association. Uh, many of you may know us more familiarly as the Tenbrook Mansion. The Albany County Historical Association is a 78-year-old institution. It is an educational museum with a charter from the state of New York. And our mission is to preserve, present, and interpret the rich and diverse culture and history of Albany County. So um, rich and diverse is right in our mission statement and history and culture. Um, and as many of you may know, not only are we a museum, but we also have a very rich uh, cultural programming as well. Again, that's been affected by COVID-19, um, but there's been a strong tradition here of presenting concerts, plays, um, poetry readings, um, things of that nature, as well as art shows. So we deal with both history and culture as a mission statement. Did you want me to start with a walkthrough tour, Amy, or would you like me to start the video first? Well, whichever you prefer, either is fine. Okay, why don't I start the video, okay. and then I'll do kind of a casual walk of the mansion. Okay, great. Do a share, share yep. screen, all right? Are we sharing right now, Amy? Uh, no, not yet. Okay. So, yeah, when well, you I, click need, on... I, I would need to do that. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's okay. Lovely. Okay. Is it sharing now? Uh, nope, not yet. Yeah, you just click on the share screen button. There you go. It started. Perfect.
Okay, so um, Amy, would you like me to continue or? Yeah, that would be great. So what I thought I would do, um, I wanted to appreciate and thank everyone for their patience. I am a staff of one. So uh, we initially, when we signed up for this, we thought we'd be able to have someone, you know, talk and, and take you through. So I think I'll give you a little magic carpet ride on my laptop. <laughs> so we're here in the butler's pantry, which you saw a little bit of. And now we're going to walk into the dining room area. And, you know, in the comments, if you would like to share if you've been in the Tenbrook Mansion before, that would be wonderful. This is, of course, our dining room. And here's Abraham and Elizabeth Tenbrook. And, you know, we've made a shift in our tours. I must say, um, I've been here just a few days over a year, so a year and a few days. And one of the reasons I was very excited to come here is not only is it a very beautiful site, but I was so excited at how welcoming the board was and so open to really using the best historical methods for interpretation. So one of the things we've done is we've done a, a verb tense shift. So instead of saying Abraham and Elizabeth built the Tenbrook Mansion, we've shifted it to was built. And I'm sure all of you are doing that in your museum sites. It's these subtle things that are allowing us to interpret our history more fully. Um, here's an example of, I call it sort of a simple way to do interpretation on a very simple budget. I'm going to take you down the sideboard here. And you can see there's one type of serving bowl. This is about 1810. We're going to continue down the sideboard. And there's this other set, which is the 1880s. And that is something we also showed in our dining room. Um, one place setting and another. And one of the challenges we have as a site is that if we froze the year in 1798, we would have to tear down things like this wonderful marble uh, fireplace surround, which dates to about 1835. So what we showed um, in the place settings, the 18 teen era and the 1880s, we showed our visitors two different ways of um, Americans really dining and how foods, food customs reflect society. Now we're going to head into the center hall. It's going to be a little blanketed out here, but you can see there was a wonderful view. The Ten Brooks named their estate Prospect. So the idea of a view shed was always part of the idea here. Um, Abraham and Elizabeth actually acquired this land in 1763. And that's another shift in our interpretation this year. Um, we used to kind of start on the dot at 1798 when the structure was built. Um, it's likely the architect was Philip Hooker, who was an Albany architect. But we're really paying more attention to that pre-Revolutionary uh, War era. Why would Abraham and Elizabeth have chosen this site? Um, and we're looking at the history of Abraham Tenbrook more carefully. Here he is in the hallway. Uh, this is a painting uh, from 1799, which is attributed to, or excuse me, which is by Ezra Ames, the regional painter. And we're looking at this pre-revolutionary period more carefully. So Abraham and Elizabeth acquire these five acres of land in 1764 when they're both uh, 30 years old. They've been married a year. And they had intended to come here. This was really supposed to be a pastoral estate for them. And we're presenting the Revolutionary War as a great interrupter. In fact, when we have younger people on tours, we say, why do you think they didn't get around to building this mansion, you know, this estate until 1798? Well, one of the reasons of, is, of course, the Revolutionary War. And it helps our visitors and students realize, you know, in some ways, just how unexpected that event was. Another major initiative that we've been doing, uh, this was a focus for this year, and again, COVID somewhat impacted it, is we're looking at the many fine portraits in our collection. So we uh, have theme tours on portraits. And I have a background in history and art history, as well as archives. We'll do a nice close up on this portrait. Um, portraits tell you a lot about what was important to the person. And this portrait 
is quintessentially a male elite of the 1790s uh, in which he's showing how he built his wealth. And how did he build his wealth? Well, he's busy. He's signing bank documents. Um, you know, one of our visitors actually pointed out there's another quill in case one of the quills breaks. So our visitors, you know, I'm sure you find that too, help you interpret um, images more fully. And this is really an issue of the 1790s in the post-revolutionary era. There was a discomfort with how wealth, how ruling uh, classes were made. And so the idea was, is wealth and power inherited or is it because you build it? And you can see clearly um, by this portrait that Abraham Tenbrook is signaling to us that he built his wealth. So we'll do another little look around the, the uh, hall. I know it's going to white out there a bit. Some wonderful collections. Do another little close up here. And we're going to enter the parlors. COVID-19, I'll just show you a little bit. We, I don't know if you can see this, we had to put down some markers on the carpets. Uh, we used tape and I can talk about the technicalities on that, but it also allowed us to do some as you can see here. Um, so when visitors do a little bit more staging, than we've done in the past. And here's another wonderful portrait in our collection. This is by Amai Phillips, the quintessential and very well known upstate New York and New England folk art painter. And again, we look at this portrait of society in upstate New York in the Albany area uh, and changes in women's identity. So Elizabeth Tenbrook, her 1763 portrait is very flat. It's representing her as a person of wealth. And here is Anna Tenbrook. And again, looking at the details, you're able to see a book and you can actually read on the spine of the book. It says Watts and that's Isaac Watts. And he wrote three texts. One was a book of prayer and philosophy. Another one's a hymnal. He wrote Joy to the World. And another one is a philosophy book. So whatever the, the text is, we don't know exactly which one it is, she's definitely signaling to us her internal life. So, you know, the life of the mind, the life of the spirit, the life of the heart. Um, so again, we talk about those changes, we tie it into um, shifts in emphasis on women's education and um, other changes that occur in upstate New York in this period. So I'll give you another look around. And I can take us upstairs um, as well, but uh, we can do that. If, is everyone interested in me going upstairs? Hello? Yeah, that would be great. Sure, okay. <laughs> so you kind of get the whole story here. Let's see if we can get a view. As you can see, there's just tr wonderful architecture here. Head upstairs. I'll take you into some of the bedrooms. And here is an original 1798 mantle. And we use these very charming tiles as the basis of a free educational program, which I'm happy to chat about. And we also tried to come up with ways of how we could share historic documents. 
So here, let me see if you can see it. There is the 1701 Tenbrook Family Bible, um, but it's too fragile to be on exhibit. So we have this piece, um, which is a 18, excuse me, 1748 Bible, which was in better condition. And I actually just took the cover off of it because we do cover it when it's not on exhibit. So it doesn't have, um, you know, excessive light damage. You know, no matter what you do, you're gonna have fading, but we, we only uncover it when the, the visitors are actually here. If you can see that, hopefully. Okay, so if you'd like, um, I can stop the video and head downstairs for questions. Sure, that would be great. Okay, thank you. And Chris, have you had any questions come in so far? I haven't seen any yet. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, well, would you like me, I don't know, if, you know, are particular areas you'd like me to discuss or share? Well, actually, I have a question, if no one else does. Yeah. Um, you, the mansion was built in 1798, you said? When was construction started? Uh, 1797. Oh, ah, okay. It only took a year. Wow, that's interesting. Well, a couple of things. Um, we do know that they were continuing the plaster work into late 1799 and likely even into 1800. Hmm. The plaster probably dried over the winter. Um, so they were still wallpapering and, and doing things like that in, uh, in early 1800. But we do know the Tenbrooks were in the mansion. Um, another reason they moved things along was their house had burned. Um, uh, there was a fire in Albany in, uh, in 1797. So that kind of expedited. So between getting the property in 1764, the American Revolution comes, so that's the disruptor. Um, you know, Abraham serves as mayor in Albany. He gets extremely busy. Um, and then, you know, there's a fire that happens in 1797. So there's a great reason to, you know, really push the building of the site along. Um, and it's possible that, you know, they were staying with some family. Uh, we do have some records showing how busy they were in choosing, you know, all the finishes for the house. Catherine, we have two questions, both in the question and answer and in the chat about the location and directions to the mansion. Yes, um, our location, if people know where the Palace Theater is in Albany, we're very close by, um, it's on our website. Our website is www.tenbrookmansion.org. So T-E-N-B-R-O-E-C-K mansion. And if you go to contact, you'll see directions. Um, so we're just, you know, about a minute from the Palace Theater and our hours. So that's been affected, of course, by COVID-19. Um, as all of us know, museums are phase four. Uh, so we went to programming on Thursdays and Saturdays and on alternate Fridays we have programs. This is one of those alternate Fridays. We also, as I'm sure many of you dealt with, had to do the issues of pre-registration for tours and you know, very, you know, no increase in our budget, right? We're all struggling with this is how do we accommodate these changes? So we chose Eventbrite um, just as something off the shelf that we could use. Um, one of the challenges is when you give a guided tour per the New York State, you have to close the tour to all other people. So what I do is I wait to see if someone's registered and then I have to like close out that tour. Um, so that's taken up a lot of staff time, um, which is me, you know, making sure I you know, don't accidentally let two family groups into a tour. So far, I've, I've really been on it um, and it hasn't been an issue. And our visitors have thanked us. I mean, when you come in, you see, I'm sure all of you, social distancing signs. We ask people to wear masks. I'm not wearing a mask because I'm just the only one here right now. Um, sanitizing stations on both floors that we show to the public. Um, and we actually um, rearrange, we have stanchions now, which we did not have before. I showed you briefly some of the yellow tape, how we didn't put that on historic carpets. Those are reproduction and we used frog tape, uh, which is the most, uh, the lightest of all the painter's tape and we tested it um, on a sample for a while to make sure 
you know, that there wasn't uh, a lot of adhesive transfer. Catherine, we have uh, two questions about the, ba uh, the background of the Tenbrocks, uh, including uh, what was Abraham Tenbrock's occupation? Yes, that's a great question. So um, to Abraham Tenbrook's family in the Netherlands um, were bakers and Tenbrook means on the brook. So we're, we're more familiar with the idea of van, like van Rensselaer, meaning from Rensselaer, but ten means on the brook, and that's actually a Flemish uh, prefix. So they are Dutch, but some French, some Flemish influence there. So they're bakers in the Netherlands, and the van Rensselaers are, of course, diamond merchants. The ten brooks come to New Netherland in the 17th century, and they start to build their wealth as traders, as merchants, um, and entering into civic government. Um, so there are two generations of Tenbrooks who are mayors of Albany, and Abraham Tenbrook continues that tradition. Um, he makes a very strategic marriage. Uh, there had already been intermarriage between the von Rensselaers, who are the absolute pinnacle, of course. This is the largest and wealthiest of all the patroonships. Um, but he marries into this dynasty, really, and he continues that tradition. So he serves in the colonial assembly. Um, he's a revolutionary war general. And then he serves as mayor of Albany uh, two terms after the revolution. And he also serves in the New York State Legislature. Uh, a semi-related question from the chat. Did the mansion stay in the family through all this time? Excellent question. And that gets into a lot of issues that we have of um, how do we, I don't know if you want me to be on video or not. <laughs> Does this help? I don't know. Um, that's a really good question. The Abraham Tenbrook dies in 1810 and Elizabeth dies in 1813. And the house passes to the Kane family and then the King family, James King. And James King is a chancellor of, on the Board of Regents. So there's that connection. That, that's actually an area we do need to do more research on. Um, and then the Olcott family uh, purchases the mansion in 1848. And they are here for 100 years. They are actually the family that donates the Tenbrook Mansion to the Albany County Historical Association. So they're here 100 years. And on our tours, normally, like I said, if I had two, you know, myself and another staff person, I'd give you a little bit more of a typical tour. So it was really off my, um, you know, off my pattern because trying to run the computer. But we do shift um, our interpretation in the dining room. In fact, the qu question we use to pivot is we say, who created this beautiful space? And then we talk about the 1790 census in which there are 16 10 brooks. And then I, I always share, I say sadly and wrongly, there are 12 other individuals. Um, and sadly and wrongly, those individuals were enslaved. So we talk about the role of slaves in building this space, enslaved persons. Um, the first residents on this five acre plot were likely African American, uh, either enslaved or free, uh, because gardening was done with a shovel by hand. So then we do a pivot um, and say that, you know, there are changes. New York State, of course, um, abolition or outlaw slavery in 1827. And then we shift to the Alcott family. Uh, Thomas Worth Alcott was born in Hudson, New York. And Hudson, if anyone knows that area, you know, even to this day has a little bit different rhythm than many of the um, Hudson River towns, which have more of a Dutch influence. Hudson was a Quaker uh, run town. It had a very strong New England influence. And Thomas Worth Alcott uh, grows up there. He's a boy genius. He works his way up through the banks. He becomes uh, president of a bank, the Farmers and Mechanics Bank. He comes to Albany. And he deliberately seeks out this house because it already has a certain cachet to it. It's 50 years old, which doesn't seem that old, but think about it. The changes that are going on in the early 19th century America are dramatic. Uh, so there's a feeling that it's from a different era, and certainly if you're trying to establish yourself in one society, you kind of choose a gracious home. People still do that to this day, right? Um, that might be a choice that say someone or something moving into an area might do to this day. You know, how do you establish yourself? And we do share that the Alcotts were pro-abolition. They supported um, education for girls as well as boys. And some very important research we're working on is that Thomas Worth Alcott also invested in businesses owned by free persons of color. We didn't just talk about freedom. 
he actually invested um, and one of the families he served on the board of directors for and invested in was called the Black Schuylers. That's a historic term, but these are descendants of individuals enslaved by the Schuylers. So it's almost a complete turnaround, 180 degrees. Um, you see a very different um, focus and emphasis here. Um, the Alcots were also involved with the Dudley Observatory. He was president of that, sort of involved in scientific um, research. Uh, I'm actually um, currently in an email discussion with a descendant of the Olcott family, and he pointed out that I think it's his great grandfather or great 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 uncle. I'll have to check. Um, sponsored a university professor uh, from Union to go to East Asia and to collect photographs and to collect artwork to bring back to the area to promote the study of East Asia, the study of East Asia. So one of the, the theses that we're really developing is what role do the Olcotts have in really shaping 19th century Albany? Um, he's the quintessential Victorian. We have a question about the archival collections, about any car archival, uh, sorry, archival collections located. Are they actually located in the mansion? Is space an issue? Do you have climate control? That's a great question. Um, so I, I so enjoyed, you know, speaking to fellow museum and library and archives people. Those are the those are the wonderful questions I enjoy getting. So our collection is in two locations. There are of course collections, as you saw here at the mansion. There are some areas that we do want to work on. There's some storage that is not really, as you know, not quite at the level we'd like. Uh, we're very fortunate to have a partnership with the Albany Housing Authority. And there's an 1852 to 1856 structure, which is on the western end of the Tenbrook's land plot. And remember, I mentioned James King to you, who was a New York State Chancellor. Um, he built that structure and it has been renovated. The Housing Authority did it um, where they preserved the shell of the building, but the interior is modern. And we do have a climate controlled, you know, sprinkler, all that good stuff system there. And the majority of our archives and manuscripts and textiles are housed there. Excellent. And um, Megan, I see that your hand is raised. Did you have a question? Um, no, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just testing it out. <laughs> Does anyone else have another question? Uh, Rita? I just allowed her to talk. Okay. She doesn't. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, mm -hmm. What are some of the projects that your volunteers are doing in the archives? Yes, thank you for asking about that, Rita. Uh, so as I mentioned, I've been here about a year, and when I got here, um, one of the challenges as a small museum is there was really no dedicated time for collections care. Um, that was a challenge for us with a small budget, um, a very small staff, a staff of one, and I do have a background in that. Um, and I know the best way to take care of your collections is always to do partnerships. So um, I've been here a few weeks and I started recruiting a specific uh, volunteer team to work on our archives. And that involved meeting with people, um, doing a one-on-one -on -one training session. So this is all before COVID, of course, this is in the fall of last year. So just a, not quite a year ago. And we drew individuals, you know, we promoted it through our e-newsletter. Uh, and sort of were specific of what we we're looking for, detail-oriented, um, some background in education, history, or museums. And the team that we drew together had a background either working in museums. There's actually someone who used to work here about 25 years ago, someone um, associated with the Corning Museum of Glass, so someone in teaching. So people who had a little bit of a specialized interest. Um, and we were able to build that team. Um, I created an archive survey sheet and we did a couple of mini trainings. And the first few weeks, we had to check in with each other every week. So they come at a dedicated time, which is Thursdays, 10 to noon. And that worked well, so we didn't have to keep rescheduling. So that saved time. Thursday, but believe it or not, and I'm sure you're not surprised, they have come. Um, you know, we had a brief shutdown with COVID. We followed all the rules on that and they wanted to come back. Uh, and that was a really effective and efficient way of running the program. So I didn't have to say, you know, are you available Tuesdays? Are you available Saturdays? No, Thursdays, 10 to 2, 2. I knew not to block out, you know, I blocked out my schedule. We would always check in with each other. Um, and we kept it at the survey level. And, you know, I'm talking to a professional group, so you know this well. 
But the greatest challenge in collections management, and we all do this, right? You know, I love history too. I love art. We want to drill in. We want to do that deep dive and, you know, find out every detail about a particular wonderful photograph. And then meanwhile, 150 linear feet is not getting addressed. So we were very disciplined. Um, and we said, this is a survey. We're measuring, you know, linear feet. We, everyone has their own toolkit of, of pencils, pencil sharpener, um, rulers. And we showed them how to do it. And, you know, when the temptation was there to say, oh, I'd like to spend four hours looking through these photos. I mean, they are volunteers, but the group is very disciplined and they realize, you know what, if we do this, we're not going to get to the end. So we're about 80% complete. We would have finished by now, except we did have the COVID shutdown. Um, and they, there are specific things that we're looking for. For example, we received funding for a cultural landscape report. So we're doing more research on our gardens. And so again, they're working on these, you know, these survey sheets. Um, this isn't one of them, but just a sheet. And then they can just put a little pencil mark G, you know, of his garden. And then I can go back and, you know, if I have to pull this material for the researcher, I can easily do so. Um, and then fortunately, you know, I, I wrote a grant um, for New York State Archives, an arrangement and description grant. We're excited to share and very grateful that we're fully funded. So we will be hiring a contract archivist and a contract archives technician and also a contract um, digital archivist. And now they're gonna take it to the next layer. So they'll work from these surveys. Um, and again, we're very disciplined. You know, let them do the arrangement and description. We got some boxes so we can properly rehouse things. And then, you know, as part of the grant, as you know, you always have to do matching. Um, as we do identify those really important photographs, those really amazing manuscripts, then we can go back in and the volunteers and myself will be the ones doing the more, you know, detailed description. So it's almost a flip. So we started out at the beginning, not diving deep. Now we have, you know, we're going to hire this team to do kind of a me medium level work. And then we're going to return as volunteers and staff here and our, you know, our board too, because we have many board members interested, then we're going to go to the detail work. So it was really important for us to stay focused. Um, and, you know, I kind of would say this, you know, how do you start an archive survey with zero budget? When I got here, there was no budget for archives. Uh, and if I was over in the other space, I'd show you, we created flags of, of paper to show when it was finished. Like we had finished surveying this drawer, we had finished surveying this box, and the paper is orange. Why is the paper orange? Because that was what was in the, the file cabinet when I got here. We were like spent no money. <laughs> we literally did not. Uh, we just said orange. Okay, so it's orange. Um, and that's how we did it. And, you know, we, we got a couple of boxes, but we pretty much kept everything as it was. We realized we cannot rehouse. We need to keep the survey going. And I think keeping that focus really allowed us to uh, get as far as we did. Does anyone else have another question for Catherine? Uh, Rita, you have your hand up. Um, I think anything, that's up anything? from before. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I see someone mentioned they've been here several times uh, for the Santa Claus celebrations. So I, I should also share that. Um, that was a challenge. I've been here uh, just over a year and about 50% of my time has been during the COVID, the, the era of COVID. Um, so the programming that we're really, really known for, such as our Holiday House, which is an annual December celebration. It was started in the mid 1980s. Um, there's a board member who has a, you know, a Cinder Claus outfit, and reads to children. We realized all of these things would be impacted. So I showed a little bit on that video. Um, we just tried to find ways. I know all of you are as well. Um, finding ways to keep your programming going when you can't have the one-on-one. -on -one. Or in our case, we weren't always sure. I'm sure you were all in the same place. Like, what are the rules? How should we interpret it? Um, so I'll share with you a little bit another way we did some children's programming. Um, so remember I showed you those titles. So we created a storybook and you can uh, get this email to you or we also print it out and send it to you. So here's the first page, which is the tile. And then as you can see the kids, there's five more pages. They can create their own ideas. And then here's the last page. And we created a little video, uh, how-to video that people have linked to, and we've mailed these out. And as I think I saw, you saw in the video, we have an educational kiosk. Another thing we did, um, because we are in Arbor Hill, which is a high-need community, 
in our programming, you know, as you know, this is the time of year to get these things. You can get 50 cents, 75 cents. You can get bulk um, school supplies. And we include that in the kits um, because we know that, especially in high need communities, just something simple like adding in a 50 cent pair of scissors will allow a child to just work on the project. Um, you know, parents are working several jobs or they're working evening shifts and stuff for a kid to say, mom, can you go get me some scissors? It just may not be a possibility. So we do write this into our grants. Um, and then interestingly, we had already had this approach, but with COVID-19, and I'm sure you're all doing the same thing, you realize you can't really share the supplies or you have to do all this sanitizing. So again, these kind of take home kits ended up being COVID, COVID adaptable or something like that. It, it was adaptable to the, the era of COVID. I'll put it that way. Susan apparently is wondering if you do any collaboration with the Myers residents. We do, we do. Um, one of the, inter several ways. Um, first of all, I've met with Paul and Mary Liz, uh, just wonderful real models of what a historic site and museum should be. Um, and we have um, complementary mi uh, missions, you know, not the idea of competing, very complementary. So one of the things is really emphasizing how much the Alcott's were involved with the abolition movement, more as people who supported businesses run by free persons of color, but that too is, is a form of advocacy. That too is a form of service. Um, another way is a, we do do um, sharing of information. And one of our dreams uh, on the cultural landscape report is to have a recommendation for connecting green spaces. So there's Tivoli Park, there's the Myers residence as you come down Livingston Avenue, and of course the Tenbrook Mansion. Um, we're thinking of like diagonal walking paths and then going up to Livingston. Obviously, we're not going to change all of Livingston, but you know, maybe putting planters. The Myers residence has a garden and then, you know, continuing your walkway. So to really make a great exercise space for the community and also, you know, out of town visitors. What a wonderful walking tour. So there's other collaborations uh, that way. Does anyone else have any questions for Catherine? I think that's all. Okay. okay. Well, thank you, Catherine, for thank taking you. the time today and showing us. It was really great and really informative. So uh, hopefully everyone can get there in person um, sometime in the near future now that things are opening back up. Yes, and like I said, we are going to be putting out a position for a contract archivist. So, you know, probably we could share the, the posting with you. Uh, we yeah. welcome volunteers as well. So thank you so much, Amy. Okay, great. Thank you all. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, and I hope that everyone has a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much.